If tomorrow all the things were gone, I'd work for all my life, and I'd have to start again with just my children and my life. I thank my lucky stars to be living here today. Cause the flag still stands for freedom And they can't take that away From the lakes of Minnesota to the hills of Tennessee, across the plains of Texas, and from sea to shining sea, from Detroit down to Houston, and New York to LA, where there's pride in every American heart, and it's time we stand and say And I'm proud to be an American But at least I know I'm free And I won't forget the man who died Who gave that right to me And I'll gladly stand up next to you And if it hurts till today Cause there ain't no doubt I love this land God bless the USA And I'm proud to be an American Where at least I know I'm free And I won't forget the man who died Who gave that right to me And I gladly stand up I love this land. God bless the USA. God bless the USA. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Well, if you're not awake after that song, your wood is wet. If you need a bulletin, go ahead and raise your hand. We'll get you a bulletin. I'm glad you're here this morning. And you can follow along with the sermon, fill in the blanks as, as we go along. <clears throat> Would you pray with me? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that we can live in a, a country where we are free, free to worship you. Even though those uh, rights are being infringed upon lately, Father, we still are a free country. So, Father, I pray that your churches will shine your light, that we will represent Jesus Christ well in our communities, Father Lord. And remember that, that you're the one who can truly set people free. Living in a free country doesn't mean that we're free from sin and temptations and Satan's attacks. So, Father, we thank you that your word says that, that if the Son sets us free, we are free indeed. Father, I pray that you'll bless our worship of you here this morning. May you speak through me, give me your words to proclaim, and touch the hearts and minds and lives of all the hearers here today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <clears throat> you know, every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up, and it knows it must run faster than the fastest lion, or it will be killed. And every morning in Africa, a lion wakes up, and knows that it must run faster than the slowest gazelle, or it will starve to death. So every morning in Africa, when the sun rises, whether you're a gazelle or a lion, you better be running. Does that describe your life? Every morning when the sun rises, you start running. 
and we run all day long until we hit the bed at night and we plop our head on the pillow and then we wake up and we, we do it all again. And we just run. Some are, some are being chased by lions and some of us are running after gazelles and some of us are just running. We're, we're just in this rat race. You know, we're, we're making good time though, aren't we? <clears throat> I know one time I went on a conference with a, a former youth minister, uh, not here, but uh, in fact in my first church, and we're going to a conference, and we're making really good time until we realize we're going in the wrong direction. See, it doesn't make, matter if you're making good time if you're going in, in the wrong direction. Amen? You know, but life needs to be more than, than a rat race. It should be meaningful and, and enjoyable. And I want to suggest to you this morning, in order to make your life more meaningful, to follow Jesus Christ. Because it's only as we live for Christ that our, our life takes on meaning. and Our life is not dictated by circumstances. After all, how many of us wake up in the morning and say, I really want to feel, fail today? You know, none of us. We want to succeed. And there's two words that can never go together, and that's failure and, and Christ. The two just cannot go together. Rhetorical questions. I want to ask you, how do you define success? How do you define success? It's been said you're not really successful in some, until someone claims to have sat next to you in, in school. Uh, some successful people were asked this question, how you define success. Richard Branson, he's a, he's a billionaire. He says success is being fully immersed in your work. And that's great if you're a billionaire, but what if you're a garbage man, right? Stephen Covey defined success by... Uh, living by what you want said at your funeral. So, th so think about that. What you want said at your, at your funeral, start living that way now. He says that's what success is. And then I can't pronounce his last name, Deepak Chopra. He's a, like a spiritual advisor. And he says success is continued expansion of happiness and worthy goals. So how do we define success? Do you define success by the world standards? The world says, you know what, if you can climb the, the top rung of the corporate ladder, you have succeeded. The world says if, if you become a, a famous, a movie star, or entertainer, then you have arrived. You are successful. You know, we all have great visions of being successful, don't we? And for many of us, well, we can define that in, in different ways. However, the Lord doesn't define success as we do. How does a church, for example, define success? By the three B's, right? Bodies, the budget, and the building. That's how the church defines success. But the Lord may not define success that way. In fact, the Lord, I think, is more concerned about our spiritual growth than the number of bodies we have, right? Jesus told his disciples, greatness was achieved by being last. Greatness was achieved by being a servant or a slave and being the least. That goes against the grain of the world's definition of success, doesn't it? I think the most profound example I, I read one time was in 1977 when the newspapers came out in August. In fact, around August 16th or 17th. And the headlines all over the world carried this. The king is dead. Meaning the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley. And for many days and weeks, uh, 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 journalists camped around Graceland. Many people visited Graceland, and the whole country was, was mourning because the king of rock and roll had, had died. And at the same time, another Memphis man also died, and his name was Dr. Lee. And he was pastor of Bellevue Baptist Church for 32 years. This man was personally responsible, was used by the Lord to lead. Uh, he led thousands of people to Christ. The same newspaper that had the king is dead on the front page, on the back page, had a small little article mentioning Dr. Lee's death. What a contrast, how the world defines success, right? I think the way that we need to define success is, are we successful in God's eyes? Because Jesus says, what does it matter if you gain the whole world, but you forfeit your soul? There was a young man who studied under a, a master violinist. For years and years he practiced till he had his recital and he, and he got through his recital and it was flawless. And, and the, the crowd and everyone was standing and, and applauding. 
But the violinist wasn't happy. He wasn't smiling. His eyes were fixated on one man up in the balcony. And that was his teacher. And then finally his teacher stood up. And then the violinist smiled and was happy. You see, the the applause of the crowd meant nothing to him if his master was unhappy. And you see, the applause of the world should mean nothing to us if our master is unhappy. So how do you define success? Too many Christians, I think, we define success by the world standards. How much money we have in a bank, the education, the jobs that we have, right? This morning I want to look at six steps to success in in God's eyes. If you would, look at Luke chapter 5, page 1567 in your pew Bible. We'll starting in verse 1. And just to give you some background information, the popularity of Jesus at this time, Jesus was like a celebrity. Everywhere Jesus went, the crowds were, were following him. And on this day, Jesus was trying to teach the word of God on the, on the Sea of Galilee, on the shore of Galilee. And if you can imagine, the crowds were just crowding in on him. So he looked and he saw a couple of empty, empty boats there and he knew who the fishermen were. So he asked to get into the boats and he pulled the boats out from shore So now he could teach the audience from the shore. And then after he was done with that, then he turned his attention to the disciple in the boat, specifically Simon Peter. And we'll look at that in in just a minute. Let's look at Luke chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake, of Gennesaret, or Galilee, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little bit from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, We've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they had caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, who was also Peter, right? Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed Jesus. So number one in your handout... The first step to success is you got to let Jesus into your boat. You got to let Jesus into your boat and into your life. Verse 3 says, He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon. I want to ask you, have you let Jesus into your boat? Into your life? Well, you might ask, Well, how do I do that, Pastor? And that's a good question. How, How do we do that? Well, one passage that I think really explains it is Revelation 3.20. If you want to turn to Revelation 3.20, keep your place here in Matthew. We're not done yet. And look at page uh, 1871 in your pew Bible, Revelation 3.20. As Joe mentioned in the the park in New Orleans, Ninth Ward District, I had the opportunity to present the gospel to many people down there, many uh, I talked to, uh, claimed to be Christians, but the further I dug, uh, they, they didn't know what they believed. They weren't sure of their salvation. And some, um, for this time, they were just hungry. They, they wanted to hear everything that, that I had to say. So I'm going over with them, or with you, what I went over with them. The first thing Jesus says, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. So where is Jesus in this picture? Is he inside or outside? 
And granted, this is symbolic of the church he's talking to. I know that. This is symbolic of the church. But I think it's interesting that Jesus is supposed to be the center of the church. And where is he? He's outside the church and not going to get in. And Jesus is supposed to be in the center of our lives. But where is he? I think he's knocking on the door of our hearts and lives saying, can I come in? Can I come in? And Jesus says, if you open that door, he says, I'll come in. He says, I won't force my way in. You have to open the door, and, and I will come in. Amen? So have you invited him into your life? Have you opened the door and invited him in? Quickly over the plan of salvation. Number one, God loves you, and he has a plan for your life. So why is it that we don't experience this life that God has come to give us? Well, we have a little problem called sin. I'm being facetious when I say little problem. What's the middle letter in sin? I. That's what sin is all about, isn't it? I. I want to do it my way. Sin is, is disobedience to God. Uh, uh, we don't want to do it God's way. We want to do it our way. You know, trying to explain sin to a 10-year-old is not always easy. And I just had to explain to him the best that I possibly could is it's disobeying God. When God tells us to do something and we say no, we want to do it our way. Mankind is sinful and, and separated from God. God wants a relationship with us, but we're separated from God because of our, our sin. And the only remedy for sin is Jesus Christ. That's God's only provision. It's not going to church. Church is good, but it won't save you. It's not getting baptized. That's important, but it won't save you. The only remedy for sin is Jesus Christ. Why is that? Because God says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's a gift. We can't work for it. We can't earn it. It's a gift. We just receive it. But we all earn death because of our sin. And if baptism could save us, then, boy, God would be cruel to send his son to die such a brutal death if baptism or going to church could save us, right? And we must individually receive Jesus as, as Lord and Savior. We must personally invite him into our lives. It doesn't matter if you were brought up in a family that was uh, uh, in, into church their whole lives. Have you personally opened up the door of your heart and life and invited Jesus Christ into your life? I think I would be remiss if I didn't give us an opportunity to do that right now. Because I think the whole rest of the sermon would be insignificant. Because if we don't let Jesus into our boat and into our life, then all the other points in the sermon don't count. The first step to success in God's eyes is receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior. That's the very first step. So let's just, for a moment now, let's just bow our heads. And I want to take a moment to invite him into our, our lives, if you haven't done so already. And maybe you have. Well, this is just a, a further confirmation. And God knows your heart. He's not so concerned with your words as he is the attitude of your heart. So just say this prayer from your heart. Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I open the door of my life to receive you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for forgiving my sins and for giving me eternal life. Take control of the throne of my life and make me the kind of person you want me to be. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. So if you invited Jesus now into your boat and into your life, let's go to the second step. Second step is let Jesus now steer the boat. Once Jesus comes into the boat of your life, he, he, he's not a co-pilot. He's not content to be a passenger. Jesus now takes control of the whole boat, where the boat is going. Amen. Verse 3. Luke 5, verse 3, are you with me? Back to Luke chapter 5, verse 3. Then Jesus asked Simon Peter to put out a little bit from shore. To put out a little bit from, from shore. Uh, let's look at the, the third step. Moving along a little bit. Let God take you into deeper water. Let God take you into deeper water. 
So first let God take you away from shore, let him take control of the boat, let him steer the boat, and then let him take you into deeper water. Verse 4, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. I've been trying to convey this idea to the church for, for many months, or maybe even years, is that it's in the deep water is where we draw closer to God. It's in the deep water where we really encounter God. As You've heard some of the testimonies here today. Some of us, we, we've received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and we've done nothing with our faith but sit on the shore and put up a beach umbrella. And we're content on the shore, but you're bored in your faith, aren't you? You haven't encountered anything of Christ. You haven't really been used by God, but we're sitting on the shore, and we seem to be content with that. And the Lord is in the deep water saying, come on, let's go deeper. Let's go deeper. I remember when I was a kid and I was learning how to swim, and my parents took me out into deep water, and you better believe I was clinging to my parents with all my might. And that's okay. You know what? When the Father takes us out into deep water, he says, cling to me. That's fine. Cling to me. But he says, I want to show you some things that I just can't show you on the shore. You have to come into the deep water with me. You have to get in over your head. You have to get into a position in your life where you have to rely totally on me. And that's scary, isn't it? It's scary to go into to, to deep water. Some of you who went on the mission trip, you left your comfort zone. You left the shore and you went on the mission trip in the deep water. And I'm here to tell you, they came back changed because they encountered God in, in a more meaningful and deeper way on the mission trip. And I pray the whole church can experience that, whether it's a mission trip here at home or every day just stepping out in faith in what the Lord calls us to do, big things or small things. Amen? So Jesus tells Peter, he says, Peter, I want you to pull out into, into, into deeper water. And I, what, what's interesting is Simon Peter was reluctant at, at, at first to pull out in deep water because there were two things about what Jesus was asking. The time to go fishing was at night, and the place to go fishing was in shallow water. So now here Jesus is telling Peter, Peter, I want you to pull out at the wrong time, daytime, and in the wrong place, deep water. So Peter, Peter objects at first. Verse 5, Simon answered, Master, we've been working hard all night. I, can, can you just hear the tone and what he's saying? Uh, now imagine you're on this fishing boat. You've been, you've been at it all night. And to make matters worse, you haven't caught anything. Right, And now you have this carpenter. Now you're a fisherman by trade. Now you have this carpenter coming onto your boat, telling you to go fishing at the wrong place at the wrong time. And you almost want to say, you know what, Jesus? I'm the fisherman. You're the carpenter. Take a seat. I know about fishing. I know what to do. You don't. But what's Peter's response? But because you say so, Lord, I'm going to let down the net. Even though I know better. I know better, Lord. This is foolish what you're asking me. I know better. But I'm going to do it. You know why, Lord? Because a while back, when you knocked on the door of my heart, and I invited you in as my Lord and Savior, I made you Lord, Master, and King, and that means I obey you. So whatever you say, I do. And it doesn't make sense, Lord. It doesn't make sense, but because you say it, I'm going to do it. Amen? Amen. And, and what was the response? Let's look at the fourth step. The fourth step. Realize failure is not possible with Jesus. So when Jesus gets into your boat, when Jesus starts steering your boat, when Jesus takes you out into deeper water, and when Jesus starts asking you to do some things that just don't make sense, realize you can't fail. Do you understand that? You cannot fail. Now, it may look foolish, 
I think it was Naaman who had leprosy in 2 Kings chapter 3 or 5 who had to wash himself in the river seven times. And he got mad at her. I don't want to do this. It's foolish. I got water back home. Why should I do it here? And he got mad and he almost didn't do it. Sometimes the Lord asks us to do things that just don't make sense, right? But because you say so, Lord, Master, King, your servant, your slave is going to do it. Realize failure is not possible. Look at verse 6. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish, their nets began to break. Now, how much fish did they catch last night or the night? None. (laughs) Okay. So they signaled their partners in other boats to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full they began to sink. You see, with Jesus, we, we, we cannot fail. What, it, what appears as failure to us is God's roundabout, work, uh, uh, roundabout way of working to success that we just don't see, know, or, or understand. I always think of embroidery. If you ever look at the back side of embroidery, it looks like a mess, but when you look at the front side, you can see the picture, the beautiful picture. And we always see the back side. We don't know the picture God is, is making in our lives. But because he says so, we're going to do it. Even though we don't see the picture, where he's at, at work, right? How many of us have tried and failed? Have tried and failed? Yeah, I think all of us can, can raise our hand. And I'm here to tell you that if you try for the Lord, I don't care what you're doing. If you try for the Lord, if you would just step out in faith, And what he's calling to you to do. Even if it doesn't make sense, you cannot fail. But you may say, but pastor, that person didn't receive Jesus as Lord and Savior when I tried witnessing to him. How do you define success? For some of you, you may have to redefine what success looks like. You see, the way the Bible defines success is just being obedient to what the Lord calls us to do and leaving the results to him. He didn't call us to results, did he? He just called us to be faithful. You see, I'm faithful, I'm successful every time I open up my mouth and share the gospel. Whether they receive the gospel or not, I am successful in God's eyes because I just opened up my mouth and told the difference Christ has has made in my life. Amen? And then step number five. Expect Jesus to do great things. Expect Jesus to do great things. Verse 8, are you with me? When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. Now, I think it's interesting here that this first time he calls Jesus Lord. He realizes who Jesus is. I remember in the movie Bruce Almighty, Bruce Almighty would just perform miracles for kicks. But Jesus doesn't do miracles for kicks. Jesus did this miracle to show Peter who he is. Not to show off, but to show up. To reveal his power, to reveal who he is. And Peter got a glimpse of who Jesus is. He realized this is the Lord. And he got on his knees before the Lord and says, away from me, Lord, I'm, I'm a sinful person. You see, that's what happens every time we get into the presence of, of a holy God as we sense our sinfulness. And immediately when Peter realized he was in the presence of the Holy God, he got a sense of his sinfulness. I think it's interesting when we have uh, uh, times of invitation sometimes. And it seems like the, the ones, the most sensitive to the Holy Spirit, keep coming forward. Do you notice that? The most sensitive, to, they keep coming forward. But it's the ones who are hard-hearted and feel like they're just not going to move. They constantly sit there Sunday after Sunday and they will not be moved. They have no sense of the holiness of God. They don't draw closer to God and sense that they need to repent of their sins in the presence of of a holy God. Verse verse, uh, 9, For he and all his companions were astonished to catch a fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. They were astonished. Ephesians 3.20 says, The Lord will do more than we could ever ask or imagine. When the Lord calls you to something, when he gets in your boat, when he steers your boat, when he takes you out in the deeper water, and he asks you to do some things that just don't make sense, get ready to be astonished. 
Get ready to be astonished. That's how he works. So I, I bet you I could ask 10 different people here now, and you can give me 10 different testimonies of just this, how the Lord has astonished you when you took that, that step of faith. Well, let me ask you this. Should we, should we expect anything less from Jesus? No, we should. I don't think we should. You know, Peter got a glimpse of a vision and power, and he was astonished. Let me ask you this. What was the, when was the last time you were astonished? When was the last time you got a vision of the Lord and you just had to get down on your knees before the Lord and just praise him for who he is? When was the last time? If it's been a while, then you're probably still on the shore. If it's been a while, then you're probably still steering the boat. But if you want the Lord to astonish you, you've got to get off the shore, let him take you into deeper water. Amen? Get out of your comfort zone. You've got to get out of your comfort zone. God doesn't care what you can do. Can you do me a favor, please? Turn to your neighbor, point your finger at him, and say, God doesn't care what you can do. Please, do that right now. God doesn't care what you can do. You know why God doesn't care what you can do? Because if you could do it, then it would be you doing it. God could care less what you can do. He cares about your availability, not your ability. Do you understand that? If you would just make yourself available to him, but I can't teach. Good, you're just the one he's looking for. But I can't preach. Good, you're just the one he's looking for. But I can't do this. I can't. You know what? If you will just allow the Lord to take you into deeper water, he'll astonish you. He'll astonish you what he can do in and through you. As you get in over your head and you just have to rely on him and cling to him, then he can work through you. You're finally in a position where he wants you, where you have to rely on him. You see, it's in our comfort zone that we just do the things that we know we can do. That's comfortable. Don't rock the boat, Pastor. I'm comfortable. I'm comfortable right where I'm at. I don't want you comfortable. I don't want you comfortable. I want you out of your comfort zone. I want you to experience the deep things of, of Jesus Christ. And that's only in deeper water. That's my heart's desire for the church, and that's how I define success. Not I, but how the Lord defines success. Amen? Amen. Sixth one, sixth step. Once you allow Jesus into your boat, you allow him to steer your boat, you allow him to take you into to, to deep water, and then once you're in the deeper water and he asks you to do these things and you realize you can't possibly fail, and you have a sense of expectation that God is going to do great things, and in fact, you've even seen it now, you've experienced it, your sixth and final step is to accept your new assignment and your new purpose in life. Verse 10, are you with me? Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. In other words, just as Peter caught numerous fish, he would catch numerous men. Uh, if you would... Just hold, hold that point, hold that thought right there and turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 41. Keep your place where you're at. Look at Acts chapter 2, verse 41. I've been preaching for almost 20 years now, and I think I would be astonished if my first sermon that uh, uh, many people were converted. But here's, we, we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 41, Peter's first sermon. His first sermon. Are you with me? Those who accepted his message were baptized. About 3,000 were added to their number that day. Wow! Wow! He thought he caught a lot of fish with his nets. Well, he caught a lot of men now, didn't he? 
3,000 men. I think that was an omen of things to come. That's what Jesus was showing him. You see, Peter, just as you caught a lot of fish, you're going to be catching a lot of men with the gospel now. 3,000 men were converted that day. Wow. Wow. I tell you, when you step out into deep water, God shows up and shows off. And you're amazed. You're amazed at what God does in our lives. But you got to accept your, your, your new assignment. So let's read verse 11. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed Jesus. What was Peter? A fisherman. What had he been doing his whole life? What did his father do and his father's fathers do? What trade did he learn that was passed down for years in his family? What was his retirement? Fishing. That was his whole life. That's all Peter knew was fishing. He grew up a fisherman, a boy of a fisherman. When he was a boy, his father would take him out, out fishing. And his grandfather and all his fishing boats and his nets and all the gear and everything was passed down to him through the centuries. And guess what his retirement was? Guess what he was going to pass on to his children? Fishing. But now he got a different calling in life. And what did he do with all his job security? What did he do with his retirement? What did he do with all the things that he had previously learned? What did he do? It said he left everything to follow Jesus. See, that's what happens when the Lord grabs hold of your heart and says, I got a new assignment for you. You leave everything. You leave everything. That doesn't mean you have to quit your job tomorrow. But you know what? It might mean you have to quit your job tomorrow. The question is, are you willing to do whatever the Lord is asking you to do? For some, it may be a bigger sacrifice than than others. Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross daily, and follow me. You see, the Lord requires a total commitment on our part, doesn't he? A total commitment. He's, he's happy that we show up for an hour on Sunday. He's very happy about that. But it can't stop there, can it? He wants more than an hour of your life on Sunday. Guess what he wants? Your whole life. Now, wait a minute now. I, I don't mind Jesus being my co-pilot. I don't mind Jesus being there when I need him. But now you're asking me, Pastor, that Jesus is going to control my life? He's going to influence my job, who I date? Where I live, yep, yep. You see, when Jesus died on the cross for you, he died for all of you, every part of your life. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. There's no middle ground. There's no giving him just tokens of your appreciation. In fact, your body is now a temple of God. If you opened up the door to receive Jesus Christ, the Bible says your body is not your own. You've been bought at a price. You're a temple of the Holy Spirit now. You're God's. Your body's not your own anymore. So every day you lay your body on a sacrifice on the altar for God to use as a sacrifice, as a living sacrifice. And you say, here I am, Lord. Use me. And I promise you, if you do that, you won't be bored. Your faith won't be boring. There's no such thing as as living a boring life as a Christian. I'm here to tell you. We see these commercials on TV, these beer commercials, and it, you know, the world tries to show this is how you have fun. I've been on that side of the fence, and I will never go back to that side of the fence because it's all lies. It's all lies. It, there is no fun in drugs and alcohol and sex and all that. There is no fun in that. If you want to have fun, be functioning for the purpose God has created you. Let God use you for the purpose he created you. Be plugged into his will. Be in step with the Holy Spirit. There's no greater sense of peace and joy in this life of knowing God has used you. My job is done. This message now is in your hands. What are you going to do with it? Tomorrow can be a new day. It doesn't have to be the same old, same old. You can wake up in the morning and say, Lord, here I am. 
I dedicate this day to you. I dedicate my life to you. Use me for your kingdom purposes. Use me for your will. And, I w- and he will. He will. And he will amaze you as you let him take you into deeper water. We're going to have a time of invitation, but first I, I want to pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I know that once you got into Peter's boat, his life was never the same again. Just as our life will never be the same again. Oh Lord, we can't continue on in, in sin. We can't continue on with, with seeking worldly success while at the same time we call you Lord, Master, and King. You won't put up with such hypocrisy. Father, I pray that each and every one of us from our hearts will not only call you Lord, but will live our lives in such a way that we show that you are Lord. As we leave everything, or are willing to leave everything, just to follow you, that we will do whatever it is you you call us to do. Lord, we know that when we do surrender to you, when we do accept our, our new assignment, that we can't fail. That you will do amazing things. So Father, use this time. Grab our hearts. Draw us near to you. Show us what you want us to do. Here we are, Lord. We have come to do your will. Let our mission field begin right now. Let our mission with Jesus be right now with you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.